All right, let's jump into section 111, 112. Actually, before we do that, I uh, felt like there was a little loose thread from last time. If you look on the section 109, 110, and 137 video, at the end there's a discussion about the ceiling power and whether it's appropriate or not to say that uh, people get sealed in the temple um, when the keys of Elijah are not being invoked during that time. Joseph said the keys of Elijah are to make a calling election sure. Uh, so the question is, I just wanted to wrap this little loose end up. <laughs> is it appropriate to call a marriage in the temple a ceiling if the keys of Elijah are not being used in that ceremony? It's the keys of Elias. So is that appropriate? Uh, answer, yes. Why? Uh, William Clayton, uh, when he was at the home of Benjamin F. Johnson with Joseph Smith, Benjamin was marrying Benjamin F. Johnson to his wife, and he taught Benjamin F. Johnson this. He said, Joseph said there were two seals in the priesthood. The first was that which was placed upon a man and a woman when they made the marriage covenant, and the other was the seal which allotted to them their particular mansion, only an election being made sure. So uh, it's appropriate to call both <coughs> keys of Elias a ceiling and the keys of Elijah a ceiling. The one is a conditional ceiling, the other is a unconditional ceiling. That's it. Okay? That's just wanted to clarify that and give you a great source uh, so there's no misunderstanding. Okay. Um, now, section 111, 112. Fascinating history. I want to start out with a sober quote from uh, Brother Wilfred Woodruff, who witnessed what we're going to talk about today, the season of Kirtland apostasy. Brother Woodruff says, In Kirtland, a number of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles apostatized. Why did they apostatize? It's a good question. As we go throughout uh, this today, I just want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind. Why? Why did they apostatize? Uh, maybe you'll see some relevance to our modern day. But I want to start with some good news. Good news, we call this Luther's <coughs> prophecy and Parley's preaching. So it came to pass that uh, Parley P. Pratt had a wife who was sick. She'd been sick for like uh, 12 years, I think, something like that. Uh, they could never have children. Um, they did not have very, many, uh, very much money. Uh, he was contemplating his next move when one evening his fellow member of the Quorum of the Twelve knocked on his door, and this is the story. Uh, Parley P. Pratt says, It was now April 1836. I had retired to rest one evening at an early hour and was pondering my future course when there came a knock at the door. I arose and opened it when Elder Heber C. Kimball and others entered my house. And being filled with the spirit of prophecy, they blessed me and my wife and prophesied as follows, quote, Brother Parley, thy wife shall be healed from this hour and shall bear a son, and his name shall be Parley. Thou shalt go to Upper Canada, even to the city of Toronto, and the capital, and there thou shalt find a people prepared for the fullness of the gospel, and they shall receive thee. And thou shalt organize the church among them, and it shall spread thence into the regions round about, and many shall be brought to the knowledge of the truth, and shall be filled with joy. And from the things growing out of this Toronto, Canada mission, shall the fullness of the gospel spread into England, and cause a great work to be done in that land. Close quote. Have a good evening, Parley. They leave, and Parley is left to, <laughs> kind of blinking there, uh, what just happened? This is Heber. Huh? This yeah. is Heber. Heber C. Kimball, a man known to prophesy <clears throat> like that. They said he had the spirit of prophecy more than anyone else in the first generation of the church except for Joseph Smith. Uh, so he would just prophesy stuff like this from time to time. If you get his biography, there's two different versions of his biography by Orson F. Whitney, one of the best books on the history of the church, and that these are the early years that you could possibly read. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's called The Life of Heber C. Kimball by Orson F. Whitney. And in one of the versions I have in the back, it has the prophecies of Heber C. Kimball. It's like an appendix. It just like has all these prophecies, and he just he would just drop them like that, and they would actually come to pass. For example, this one. His wife was healed from that very hour. They had a son, not that day, but later on, and uh, they, they named him Parley. Orson, and I'm uh, just kidding, no, yeah, they named him Parley, <laughs> and uh, then he went on his mission to Canada, he went up to Canada, at first he was pretty discouraged, uh, I think it was a few weeks that went by without success, and he's wondering where are these people of prophecy, right, 
Uh, then Freeman Nickerson helps him and, and introduces him to a group of seekers, one of which is named John Taylor. John Taylor, a man from England who had come uh, to Canada and was with a group there in Toronto since his party's little journey. And uh, that's where they're first acquainted. John Taylor says, if Mormonism is true, I will do everything in my power, come what sacrifice may be, to embrace it and to promulgate it. If it is false, I will fight against it. He studied the, the Book of Mormon, compared it side by side with the Bible for like two weeks, shadowed Parley Three Pratt, watching him over two weeks as he preached and interacted with people at different meetings, scripture study groups. And uh, he's, uh, there was a woman in the neighborhood that Parley Three Pratt uh, healed. She had like, I think it was a lame arm or something like that, healed her in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, all these things seem to square with John Taylor's expectations of what a true apostle would be and what the true church would be as he's read the Book of Mormon. Uh, he was converted, and uh, the future of the church will never be the same. From that mission, so he had, part of that group was another, uh, there was a girl named Mary Fielding. Mary Fielding had a brother in England named Joseph Fielding. Mary Fielding will become Hiram Smith's uh, second wife after his first wife dies. Uh, uh, she'll be the mother of Joseph F. Smith. The history of the, the future of the church will never be the same, right? Because of this mission, uh, and they start writing letters to uh, their their uh, cousins, siblings over in England, and uh, and that prepares the way for 1837 mission in England of Heber C. Kimball, which we'll pause that for a second. We'll come back to it a little bit later. But wow, 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 wow. Uh, Powerful prophecy. We're going to bookmark that. We're going to continue to move back into, let's go back to Kirtland for a minute. Uh, there comes a fight after the light. Yesterday we talked about the uh, Kirtland endowment of power. We saw there were washings and anointings going on in the temple. We saw great spiritual outpourings. Many saw angels and visions. Some even saw the Savior himself. Many had the gift of prophecy. Others spoke in tongues. People saw all kinds of uh, heavenly things. There was a personal appearance of the Savior in the temple, followed by the restoration of eternal priesthood keys by Moses, Elias, and Elijah, so that the earth could answer the end of its creation. I mean, does it get better than January 1836 to April 1836? I say it to you, nay, it does not. Uh, it does not get better than that. <clears throat> this was sort of this, I mean, this, this, this burst of celestial light was followed by a fight that came after this light. So April 6th, let's chart this here. Right around, uh, so a month or so after, a man named Daniel Tyler tells us uh, kind of the, the afterglow of this, and then what came next. He says, all felt they had a foretaste of heaven. In fact, there were several weeks in which we were not tempted of the devil. And we wondered whether the millennium had commenced. At or near the close of the endowments, the prophet Joseph Smith addressed us. Among other things, he said, Brethren, for some time Satan has not had power to tempt you. Some have thought that there would be no more temptation, but the opposite will come. And unless you draw near to the Lord, you will be overcome and apostatized. A few months later, four of the apostles were cut off from the church for apostasy. In the standing, in the standing of one or two, Others was very doubtful. Members from other quorums also fell away and were cut off. Why? Why, Wilford Woodruff asks, did they apostatize? Part of the crisis that happens in the aftermath of this was uh, two things. was financial and then faith. And these were not uh, unconnected. These are definitely tied together. Financial crisis and faith crisis. So first of all, let's talk about the Kirtland debt problem. Uh, because of the, the, the destructions of the Missouri, uh, the press in Missouri and the, Wil the, the Gilbert store there, uh, the debts that they had incurred, they bought land in Missouri according to the commandments, but they'd done it on credit, hoping that the proceeds of the printing press and the store would help them to pay off those debts. Now that those are destroyed, there's no way to pay off the debts. Ugh. Section 104 had released Kirtland from, uh, by dividing it from the United Firm. Had, release them from any obligation to help pay those debts uh, so they could manage their own debts, which they were in because they had just done Zion's camp, marching 200 plus people from uh, Kirtland to Missouri, 900 plus miles, 
that costs a lot of money and then 900 miles back um, and they're about thirteen thousand dollars in debt right now. just a lot of money back then uh, also involved with the temple there absolutely uh, plus the enormous amount of resources spent to assist the saints of missouri plus many converts this only hurts the cause a lot of them from the quote poorer class continue to gather at kirtland some hoping to be supported by the funds of the church and the generosity of the saints, which they don't have. They got generosity, but not funds. Uh, this causes several challenges, including financial strain for the church. This is problematic. In the midst of this crisis, not knowing what to do financially, uh, a fellow by the name of William Burgess arrives in Kirtland. He says, Joseph, I know where there's a large sum of money hidden in a cellar in the house, in a house in Salem. I know right where it is. Massachusetts. He claimed to be the only person living who knew the treasure in the location of the house. Persuaded by Burgess, the prophet, Sidney Rigdon, Hiram Smith, and Oliver Cowdery, leave Kirtland in late July for New York City. Uh, they went there to talk to their, uh, their debtors to see if they could delay uh, paying their debts. And then from New York City, then they came down to Salem. Even with the help of Burgess, the brethren searched in vain for the house with the supposed treasure. Burgess soon departed, explaining that Salem had changed so much since he was last there that he could not find that house. That's when section 111 is given. That's the context. That's kind of a lot of context, though. Look at me. They're right now in Salem, Massachusetts. About two days has gone by. Section 111. They'll be there for a few weeks. So this is right at the beginning. The Lord says, I, the Lord your God, am not displeased with your coming this journey, notwithstanding your follies. This might have been a dumb idea, but I'm not totally displeased. Right? I actually, turns out, verse 2, I have much treasure in this city for you, for the benefit of Zion, and many people in this city whom I will gather out in due time for the benefit of Zion through your instrumentality. Here, this is to Joseph, Sidney, Hiram, Oliver. So I have much treasure, many people, uh, and many people in this city. So uh, they're going to leave after two weeks. They're not going to preach the gospel there at all. But here's how verse 2 become, gets fulfilled. Five years later in Philadelphia, Hiram Smith gave elders Erastus Snow and Benjamin Winchester a copy of DNC 111. And he asked them to go to Salem and fulfill it. The first elder Snow was reluctant because he was anxious to return home, but he prayed for guidance, received assurance he should go. Benjamin Winchester also went, but only remained a short time. Although progress was slow first, 1842, elder Snow organizes a branch in Salem with 120 members. After spending over a year there, he left February 1843. Thus, Erastus Snow fulfilled the promise that many people would be gathered out of the city. That's from our Church History in the Fullness of Times manual. Uh, let's keep reading. The Lord says in verse 3, You should form acquaintances with men in this city, as you shall be led, and as it shall be given you. It continues in verse 4, It shall come to pass in due time I will give this city into your hands, and you shall have power over it. Uh, I'm not sure the fulfillment of verse 4. Insomuch that they shall not discover your secret parts, and its wealth pertaining to gold and silver shall be yours. I'm not sure. Verse 5, uh, related back to the Kirtland debt. Concern not yourselves about your debts. I'll give you power to pay them. Verse 6, concern not yourselves about Zion over in Missouri, for I will deal mercifully with her. Terry, in this place, I want you to hang out here for a little while. And in the regions round about, not just in Salem, but kind of wander a little bit. This is where it gets interesting. And I'll guide you by the Spirit where you should go. Verse 9, this place you may obtain by hire and inquire diligently concerning the more ancient inhabitants and founders of this city. For there are more treasures than one for you in this city. What? What's this? So they actually did. In, in, in obedience to these verses, they started inquiring about the ancient inhabitants of Salem. You guys know anything about the ancient inhabitants of Salem? The witch trials, yeah, 1692. As every schoolboy and girl knows. We should dim the lights a little further. So at least there's witch trials. Right? Uh, but this is, this is what happens. Um, they, they start attending museums, start learning about the tragic Salem witch trials among the early Puritan settlers. They read from early histories of the area. They visited Bunker Hill at Lexington, that's the area roundabout. 
And they uh, learned and reflected on the religious persecution that had come upon the poor Baptists and Quakers in Boston. They visited a Catholic convent that had recently been burned to the ground by a mob on account of anti-Catholic feeling. Oliver Cowdery wrote a ton about all this, published to the Millennial Star. There's lots of information about this. It's just reflecting on these things. Uh, they talk about walking through like the burnt, the burnt ashes of this convent, looking out on Bunker Hill, on the ground upon which the blood, blood was spilt that ensured our freedom of religion. And yet here in this land, there's so much religious persecution still. And this like had a deep impression on them as they thought about that from the Salem witch trials all the way to this burning of this convent. A uh, superb article that's written about Section 111 is by Craig Osler. He's a BYU professor, LDS scholar. Here was his conclusion in his article about this. I really liked it, so I will read it to you. He says, The journey to Salem, Massachusetts brought forth fruits much more valuable than treasure. The lessons of justice, equality, fairness, tolerance, and inclusion, so important to the fledgling restored church, were further imprinted upon the minds of its leaders during their time in Salem. It appeared highly likely that the Lord sought to ensure that these brethren learned the distinction between intolerance for wickedness and tolerance for differing religious beliefs. Later in Nauvoo, the prophet would write to welcome individuals of all religious persuasions, or no religious persuasion at all, to join with the saints in building up that city, a city that had similar aspirations to the Salem of the founders of the ancient inhabitants about whom the Lord commanded Joseph to inquire. The Salem dream was shattered when its early inhabitants became overzealous in their attempts to establish a new Jerusalem, persecuting innocent people. Evidently, the Lord hoped to warn and educate the early leaders of his church concerning the tendency of some in religious societies to establish their own righteousness by excessively crusading against real and supposed evils among them. When this occurs, innocent individuals suffer at their hands and religion becomes a stink in the land. And here's his conclusion. The kingdom of God has needed and will continue to need to put into practice these important lessons. Consequently, the revelation in Doctrine and Covenants section 111 has had more influence on the building up of the kingdom of God than it has previously been given credit for. Uh, the Lord wanted to learn some history lessons. Give them some religious tolerance, uh, some views to not be so insular. It's not either we convert you or we wash our feet and... Like, that's it. We'll have no more association with you. Uh, this is much more magnanimous vision of inclusion, uh, ecumenical open-mindedness. Now, upon his return to Kirtland in September, uh, Joseph drops a prophecy. As he gets back, he senses something. In a meeting, he says, let's have someone else read. Brian, go for it. <clears throat> we are now nearly as happy as we can be on the earth, on earth, for we have accomplished more than we had any reason to anticipate when we had begun. Our lovely and beautiful house is finished, and the Lord has acknowledged it by pouring out His Spirit upon us here and revealing to us much concerning His purpose in regarding to the work which we are, of, which He is about to perform. So you can almost hear birds chirping in the background as he's talking about this. Right? And then he says this. Furthermore, we have plenty of everything necessary to our comfort and convenience. And judging for appearances, one would not suppose that any could occur <laughs> that would break up our friendship for each other or distress us in the least. It's like nothing, nothing bad could now happen, right? <laughs> right? And he says... Now the storm clouds roll in, go. But brethren, beware, for I tell you in the name of the Lord that there is an evil in this very congregation, which, if it is not repented of, will result in making one-third of you who are here this day so much my enemies that you will have a desire to take my life, and you even would do so if God permitted the deed. Do you know what percent one-third is? 33.33 percent. That's right. And that's not, that's not good. Let's keep going. One more, one more slide. But brethren, I call you now to repent while there is room for repentance and cease all your hardness and turn from these principles of dishonesty and death which you are laboring in your bosoms before it is eternally too late. For there is yet room for repentance. 
Uh, Wilbur Woodruff said that uh, during this time period, many of the apostles are going to apostatize. Why do they apostatize? Let's keep going. <laughs> By the way, the uh, five-year prophecy, is that remember the five-year prophecy in section 64? I, the Lord, will retain a stronghold in the land of Kirtland for the space of five years. That was September 11th. It is now September. They had an idea, another idea, to make money in November, which is going to spell disaster. Mm -hmm. uh, they thought that uh, banking would be a good idea. Uh, banking, there were a lot of banks. Uh, banks had almost doubled in the United States by 1830 from the previous decade. Uh, and more and more need for land and loans and credit. And so they thought, let's open up a bank. Orson Hyde went to go get a charter for the bank. Uh, Parley P. Pratt went to go get uh, plates where you could make money, like the, the imprint plates. Uh, Oliver Cowder was successful, but Orson Hyde returned with some sad news. He said they won't give us a charter. There's all these hard money Democrats, they're not going to let us you know, do this. And they were turning away a lot of people, not just the Mormons. So instead of being a bank, they decided to make it an anti-bank. Anti-bank means not a bank. And, <laughs> and so they... Uh, and so. I think you can see here, you can't see it super well, it says bank here, but they put on the little, because oh, Oliver had already gotten the plates made, so then they created a little thing that says A-N-T-I right there, a little dash, anti-bank. Uh, so you can't really see it, but it says church. Right, yeah. so like they, they carved that into their plate? Yeah, they like added it to the plates. Uh, okay, so it's an anti-bank. They thought that maybe they could just create a private business that could be involved in banking activities and it would still be able to you know, it doesn't have to be a public or federally involved anything. It would just be their own private business, but involved in banking. It wasn't FDA insured? Not FDA insured, no. They called it, ironically, the Kirtland Safety Society Anti-Banking Trust, which turned out to be not safe. Not safe at all. <laughs> she so called it Kirtland anti -banking. Joseph thought that if he went to, uh, if he got a charter for it, it might become more legitimate, and so he went to Michigan to get what they called the Monroe Charter to, to uh, uh, add legitimacy to the bank. So uh, while he's gone, he left uh, in February. He comes back uh, late February, or sorry, at least end of January, comes back late February. And while he's gone to Michigan, uh, there is a meeting held in the Kirtland Temple, apostates, who are uh, seeking to overthrow Joseph Smith and appoint David Whitmer to be the leader. Joseph had said uh, earlier in Missouri, he had appointed David Whitmer as the man who should succeed him were Joseph Smith to fall. Joseph said, you will be the man uh, who will succeed me. Many are now calling Joseph a fallen prophet, and so they feel like it's time to make that ecclesiastical move. It's time to out Joseph Smith and bring in David Whitmer as, as the guy. The only problem was that one mistake they made was inviting Brigham Young to that meeting. <laughs> Stupid choice. Don't invite Brigham Young to anti-Joseph Smith meeting. And there was, even, there was even someone there who had a video camera who caught all of this. So let's watch it. In his absence, we formally denounce the leadership of Joseph Smith. Yeah. And declare him a fallen Joseph prophet. Smith is the prophet of the church and thereby its leader. I know it. You know it. Rail and slander him as you will. But you cannot destroy the appointment of the prophet of God. Brigham, we're going to overrule you. David Whitmer is the man to lead us now. You can only destroy your own authority. Cut the thread that binds you to the prophet of God. And sink yourselves to hell. Uh. The guy that stood up, he's like, oh, and like, his name is Jacob Bump. He was a pugilist, which was <laughs> boxer. Boxer, yeah. yeah. That, that nowadays we call it a boxer. They used to call it pugilist. Uh, and he was about ready to throw down with Brigham. Uh, 
from what I understand, he said something like, oh, how I'd love to lay my hands on you, Brigham, right now. And they're like holding him back, and Brigham said, go ahead and lay him on, brother. Uh, things were intense you you in the curtain of the temple. Uh, <laughs> but what's uh, even worse about this is that three, three apostles, three of the members of the Quorum of the Twelve were behind this. Right? Luke Johnson, John and Boynton, and Luke's brother, Lyman. Uh, he's the older brother, younger brother, John Boynton. They were in on this. These three apostles had been caught up in the... Uh, so the economy was getting good in Kirtland, 1836. Um, and they had gotten involved in speculation, land speculation. Today we call it flipping land, where you uh, buy, say, an acre of land for $50,000, divide it into four parcels, and then sell each of them off for 25 grand. And you make grand profits, right? Uh, so you just inflate the price, buy low, inflate, sell. These poor people that are coming into Kirtland uh, are having the apostles of God sell them inflated land. Uh, they had also gone on mission shortly after the Kirtland Temple dedication, all three of these men, especially John and Lyman are egregious in this. They, they get these, these apostles, ask members of the church for money, and the members sacrificed to give them money. They, they actually got $20,000. They raised $20,000 from these members of the church. Some of them, they said they'd pay it back. Uh, then instead of using that for the ministry, they used that to buy a mercantile company. And they would sell clothing and those kinds of things. They never paid back the people that they had uh, borrowed the money from, ever. And so these, these men are, are getting involved in some uh, uh, dangerous and dishonest financial dealings and their hearts are starting to sour and turn away. So they, they felt for whatever reason that it was time for Joseph to go. So they were in on this as well. Um, now, at that point, things go from bad to worse. Uh, if 1836 of January to April was the golden age, what follows in these, last, these next uh, few months, the next year, was exactly opposite. The lead age, I don't know what's opposite of gold. Um, <laughs> it's not good. So here's what happens. So during this time, a major apostasy with greed and pride abounding. Um, the Kirtland Safety Society anti-bank fails. This came as a result of the panic of 1837. A lot of members of the church have invested their money in this bank, and now the bank fails. They're going to lose their money. Uh, so 1837, the panic of 1837, this is from Wikipedia. Uh, out of 850 banks in the U.S., 343 closed entirely. 62 fell partially, and the system of state banks received a shock from which it never fully recovered. Uh, so not just the, the Mormon bank here, this is happening throughout the, the country. Uh, it didn't help that Warren Parrish, who was Joseph's scribe during part of the Book of Abraham project, and he'd been working um, to this point, there was no need to suspect of him anything, but he had embezzled $25,000 from the fund, the Kirtland Safety Society, which did not help it uh, recover in any way, uh, actually kind of sealed its death. Um, during this time where Joseph was like, where am I at? Uh, he said he was in the Kirtland Temple and the Spirit whispered something to him. He looks over to Heber C. Kimball. He goes over to Heber C. Kimball. Uh, he says, in this state of things, God revealed to me that something new must be done for the salvation of his church. Heber says, Sunday, the fourth day of June, 1837, the prophet Joseph came to me while I was seated in front of the stand above the sacrament table on the Melchizedek side of the temple in Kirtland. He whispered to me, saying, Brother Heber, the Spirit of the Lord has whispered to me, let my servant Heber go to England and proclaim my gospel and open the door of salvation to that nation. Feeling my weakness to go upon such an errand, I asked the prophet if Brother Brigham might go with me. He replied that he wanted Brother Brigham to stay with him, and you can understand why. For he had something else for him to do. The idea of such a mission was almost more than I could bear up under. I was almost ready to sink under the burden which was placed upon me. However, all these considerations did not deter me from the path of duty. The moment I understood the will of my Heavenly Father, I felt a determination to go at all hazards believing that he would support me by his almighty power and endow me with every qualification that I needed. And although, although my family was dear to me and I should have to leave them almost destitute, I felt that the cause of truth, the gospel of Christ, outweighed every other consideration. Wow. Or 
Morris and Hyde, who had uh, faltered a little bit during this time. He actually overheard the uh, setting apart of Heber C. Kimball and saw Heber crying, his wife crying, their kids, his kids crying, hugging dad. I melted Orson Hyde's heart and he burst into the room and he said, I want to go with him. And Joseph says, granted. And so, so Heber and Orson will go to England. This will save the church. Uh, if the church was, if you imagine them as like a medical patient whose blood has gone bad here, uh, this is the medical, this is the, the blood transfusion. We're going to get British, English blood back into this body. It's going to revive the body of Christ. Uh, here are some of the statistics that come as a result of this mission. Uh, these, by 1840, so it goes in 1837, by 1840, 240 of them have immigrated to Nauvoo. You can see the numbers rise. Uh, this is by the time, that's before the saints go to Utah. During the next decade, over 10,000 British saints come to America. By 1870, there's 28,000 more. And the majority of the adult saints in Utah are former natives of the British Isles. Uh, this is, this saves the church. This infuses it with uh, fresh uh, spirit and blood and commitment. Uh, the church was dying in Kirtland. When, Brigitte, when, when uh, Heber C. Kimball got off the, the ship, the boat in England, uh, he stepped down, first apostle's foot in uh, Foreign, foreign country, besides Canada. Uh, he says as he was walking along, there was a banner he saw that said, Truth will prevail. It's like I took that as an omen that uh, this was going to work out just fine. Uh, and it did. It really did. Tons of cool stories about that England mission. Read his biography. Did I mention that? Super good. Really good. Life of Hebrew C. Kendall. Uh, meanwhile, back in Kirtland, trouble in the first presidency. Um, Frederick G. Williams is dropped from the first presidency. Why? Because Joseph suspected Warren Parrish had embezzled money. Frederick G. Williams is not only in the first presidency, he's also the justice of the peace. So for some inexplicable reason, when Joseph went to Frederick G. Williams and said, I need a warrant, a warrant to search uh, Warren Parrish. Uh, and Frederick G. Williams said, no. He said, what do you mean, no? I have strong reason to suspect he's guilty of embezzling money, and Fetch Williams said, I'm not giving you a warrant to, uh, to look into that. He's like, what? Uh, and he said, I'm not giving it to you. And Joseph said, if you don't give it to me, I'm dropping you from my quorum. He said, then drop it is. And then Joseph said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I drop you from my quorum. And Frederick G. Williams said, amen. It's awful. It's an awful little moment, so he's gone. Hiram is put in his place. Solid choice. <laughs> Meanwhile, in Missouri. <laughs> this is on backstory of section 112, by the way. Larry. <laughs> Thomas B. Marsh, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, who's stationed over in Missouri. He's there with David W. Patton. No picture available. Uh, he, he, he hears about some of his trouble with his quorum over in Kirtland. And so he travels uh, on his way to, to, uh, to Kirtland to meet with his quorum. He, he comes across Parley P. Pratt, who's now about 300 miles away from Kirtland. And they, they're coming this way, Parley's going that way. They meet, and Thomas is like, what's up, Parley? And Parley's like, ah. He's like flustered about something. There's darkness in his, in his heart and mind. He had started to, started to believe some of the people about uh, uh, maybe that Joseph was a fallen prophet, maybe he, it's, it's clear because of the financial failures of the bank that I mean, God's blessing is no longer with Joseph. And Parley's starting to get embroiled in that, starting to feel accusatory towards Joseph and Sidney for the stupidity of the banking, whole banking enterprise. And, ah, ah. and Thomas is like, now just hold on, Parley. Just hold on. Come, come with us. Come with us back. So he persuades Parley to come back with him to uh, Kirtland. Meanwhile, David W. Patton, when he shows up to Kirtland, uh, he, uh, he goes to Brigham Young. Brigham Young tries to get Patton to get his information about what's happening in Kirtland from faithful sources. But he went instead and talked with his dissenter brother-in-law, Warren Parrish, the one who had embezzled the money, leader of the Kirtland Rebellion, and thereby he, quote, got his mind prejudiced against the prophet. Another apostle here. Shortly thereafter, when he went to see Joseph Smith, David said something that insulted the prophet, following which Joseph slapped him in the face, kicked him out of his yard, 
as Brigham Young later said, this done David good. <laughs> what did he say that could be so offensive to cause Joseph to react like that? He just talked to Warren Parrish. Maybe Warren Parrish had told him something that he ran past Joseph, insinuated Joseph. We don't know for sure. But we do know that he was just in Missouri. And we do know that in Missouri is a man named Oliver Cowdery who has recently started to have some second thoughts. Not that the church isn't true, but that Joseph is not sure what's going on with Joseph. See, uh, sometime earlier, maybe a year or two earlier, Joseph had been commanded to begin plural marriage. First plural wife was a girl named Fanny Alger, who was the housemaid of Joseph and Emily. Um, we don't know exactly, exactly what went on there. All we know is that Emma found out about it. And Oliver found out about it. Joseph had told neither of them. And uh, both, it seems that both Emma and Oliver considered it adulterous. Joseph didn't defend himself. He neither confirmed nor denied. He did not teach the doctrine to Emma at that time. Later on, section 132 will explain why. It says that if you explain it to your wife and she rejects it, then she'll be damned. So he didn't explain it. Um, apparently, he doesn't even explain to Oliver. That's, that's the puzzling part. So Oliver sort of insinuates that Joseph was guilty of adultery, but he doesn't say for sure. David Patton had pressed Oliver on the issue. He's like, is he? Was he guilty of adultery or not? Uh, Oliver called it a dirty, filthy, nasty scrape. He insinuated with his eyes. David's eye. So when he goes back and he confronts Joseph, that's my guess. I don't know, Frank. You can, you can guess. My guess is he's like, what's up with Fanny Alger? I don't know. But he said something insinuating, something that would make Joseph slap him in the face and kick him out of his yard, which would do him good. So here's the Quorum of the Twelve president. What do you do if you're the president of the Quorum of the Twelve at this time? He wants to hold a meeting with the Twelve. Bring them together. 24th of July. Me and David Patton travel to do that. Parley was talking about going to England against Thomas's, didn't even ask Thomas's permission, but now Parley's floundering in darkness and confusion. Luke and Lyman Johnson and John Boynton are in rebellion, having participated in secret meetings to overthrow Joseph. He learns that Heber C. Kimball and Orson Hyde were sent by Joseph to England. What right does Joseph have to send my quorum members to England? How are we supposed to unite the quorum at? I'm the quorum president. Now David Patton's reeling too after these things he's doing. A quorum in trouble. This quorum is in trouble. <laughs> With a picture of Anne Paul. Wilford Woodruff had actually said uh, that many of these will apostatize. Why will they apostatize? So, uh, here is where section 112 is given. Par uh, Thomas B. Marsh wanted to meet with the quorum on the 24th. Just tell me the date of section 112. 23rd. 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 <coughs> he goes to see Joseph. Joseph, what's going on? Is there any direction from the Lord for me in this situation? Yeah, he's got some undercurrents of resentment towards Joseph for calling people on missions without him saying some members of his own quorum. That's the context. Section Thomas B. Marsh. Okay. What's the Lord's counsel to Thomas in this setting? Holy smokes. Talk about a setting. Talk about a setting. So first there's some personal counsel. Then there's some counsel about leading the quorum of the twelve. Then there's some specific warnings given to the twelve apostles. So, uh, give me a favorite verse in personal counsel to Thomas. Ready to go. One of President Hinckley's favorite verses. Do you know which one it was of those three? Ten. Verse 10. President Hinckley said, I love verse 10 so much. Be thou humble, Thomas. Consider the circumstance he was in. And the Lord thy God shall lead thee by the hand and give thee answer to thy prayers.
Go back to verse 1 and 2. I have heard your prayers and your alms have come up as a memorial before me in behalf of those thy brethren who were chosen to bear testimony in my name, the twelve. Verse 2, Verily I say unto you, there have been some few things in your own heart, in thine heart, and with thee, with which I, the Lord, was not well pleased. Be thou humble. Be thou humble. The Lord thy God will lead thee. Verse uh, 3, Nevertheless, inasmuch as thou hast abased thyself, thou shalt be exalted, therefore all thy sins are forgiven. I'm grateful that you have come to Joseph in humility to receive this revelation. Your sins are now forgiven. But stay humble, right? Stay humble. Uh, what does he learn about leading the twelve? Let's go to verse 12 and 13. What's his responsibility there? Michael, you want to read for us? Verse 12 13. Yeah. Okay. And pray for thy brethren for the twelve. Admonish them sharply for my name's sake. And let them be admonished for all their sins. And be faithful before me unto my name. And after their temptations and much tribulation, behold, I, the Lord, will feel after them. And if they harden not their hearts and stiffen not their necks against me, they shall be converted, and I will kill them. Where would you go? No. In context, are those verses better? Those, are, those will be good verses anyways, but now in context it's a whew. So what's Thomas to do? You are their president, you are their leader, therefore correct them. Correct them. Admonish them. For their sins, all of their sins. After their temptation and much tribulation, he knows they're going through a pretty wrenching <coughs> period here. Which the Lord had told Joseph back in section 111, don't worry about your debts. You know, they're worried about the debts. They're worried about losing the money they've lost. If they don't harm their hearts. So then his attention now shifts to 12 verse 14. Now I say unto you, and what I say unto you, I say unto all the twelve. Arise, gird up your loins, take up your cross, follow me, feed my sheep, remember what you're called for. Exalt not yourselves, some of them need that more than others. Rebel not against my servant Joseph, for verily I say unto you, I am with him, and my hands shall be over him. And the keys which I have given unto him, and also to you were, shall not be taken from him till I come. Wow. 23 to 24, uh, or sorry, 23 to 26, uh, the Lord makes a very uh, intense warning. He talks about that uh, darkness is all over the earth, verse 24, that there's vengeance coming and desolation, a day of weeping and mourning and lamentation. Look at verse 25. Where's it going to start? In his house. In my house. Upon my house shall it begin. And from my house shall it go forth, saith the Lord. First among those among you, saith the Lord, who have professed to know my name, and have not known me, and have blasphemed against me in the midst of my house, saith the Lord. He knows about the temple rebellions. It's going to start with you guys if you don't repent. And then out from there. Therefore see to it that you trouble not yourselves concerning the affairs of my church in this place, saith the Lord. Purify your hearts. Purify your hearts. Focus on that. Then go preach the gospel. So good. 33 and 34, the Lord wants to remind uh, them that... Uh, actually, look at verse 30. This, this, I didn't put it up here, but verse 30 responds to, I think, the, uh, Tom, Thomas B. Marsh's concern that uh, Joseph is sending people on missions without his say-so. Verse 30, as well as verse 20 and 21, the Lord reminds them that the Quorum of the Twelve is under the direction of First Presidency. They are your counselors and leaders. They are, uh, they are the ones that, uh, that they can act independent of the Quorum of the Twelve, for sure. So, so you can see how that's connected to immediately to the timeliness or the, the circumstances involved. So, powerful, powerful section here. Uh, let's, just, let's end with 33 and 34 with this section. Verily I say unto you, Behold, how great is your calling. Still talking to Corbin 12. My, and, uh, I'll say, so cleanse your hearts and your garments, lest the blood of this generation be required at your hands. Be faithful until I come, for I come quickly, and my reward is with me to recompense every man according to his work, as, as his work shall be. Name Alpha and Omega. So he was saying, 
that he will forgive those three who organized that yeah. temple meeting. Totally. They'll cleanse their hearts and purify themselves. Yeah. You think about it, they've been members of the church for like three years. They've been members of the Quorum of the Twelve for a year. Uh, year and, I don't know, a little more than a year. Uh, two years and a few months. Uh, they're in their 30s, some are in their 20s. This is not your weathered souls that have been, uh, you know, tried and true and proven. These guys are all the Lord has. So, yeah, I'll be merciful, I'll be patient with you. But I need you to repent. How does Thomas B. Marsh do with section 120? What's the aftermath? It's <clears throat> the aftermath of this. He writes a letter to Hubert C. Kimball, who's on his mission. Uh, no, I'm sorry. He tells, he goes to Hubert C. Kimball's wife, who then writes a letter to Hubert C. Kimball to say what Thomas B. Marsh told her. He goes to Vallette, is her name, and says, I just wanted to tell you that Hubert C. Kimball will receive no success on his mission in England because he did not go under the direction of the man who has the keys. And as you know the history, that's, that mission was not much of a success. So. <laughs> uh, in Far West, he won't apostatize quite yet. In Far West, you know there's that milk strippings incident that's famous with him, his wife. Mm -hmm. that his wife and another wife agreed to share the milk strippings, but one wife kept stripping them off. Thomas Marsh's wife kept stripping the top of the milk off and using the cream for the cheese and stuff of their family and giving all the lesser good stuff to the, another family. Uh, she was brought before the uh, disciplinary council about that. They decided she was guilty. Thomas B. Marsh is like, what? And then he, they appeal, then they appeal all the way up to the first presidency. First presidency's like, it seems pretty obvious. She's guilty, just repent, you know. And uh, he's like, I just, I and he just goes off. And uh, he leaves the church. He'll apostatize. He'll be one of those that signs his name on the affidavit that says that Joseph is totally uh, uh, antagonistic toward the government of Missouri. It'll be one of the reasons that Joseph gets put in Liberty Jail. It'll be one of the reasons that there's the extermination order and that the saints are driven from Missouri because of him and W.W. W. Phelps and if one or two others. Nineteen years later, nineteen years later, he comes back to the church, comes back to Utah, no, not back to Utah, to Utah for the first time. He comes to, meets with Brigham Young privately in his office, and he asks if he thinks that there's any chance for him to be received back into fellowship. Brigham says, I don't know, let's put it toward the Congregation of the Saints. So a general conference was at hand, so he brings Thomas B. Marsh up to the stand. Uh, he says, you may remember Thomas B. Marsh. 19 years ago, he was among us. And he says, uh, look at him. Look at his face. <laughs> That's a really funny conference doctor. He's like, he looks like 20 years older than me. And he's not. He's like one year older than me or whatever, two years old. He's like, see what happens when you stay in the gospel? <laughs> see what happens when you leave? You know, it's, Thomas B. Marsh is like, okay. Uh, but then he says, anyway, I'd like to turn the time over to Thomas B. Marsh. He'd like to say some things to you. He gives this talk, and here's, here's just an excerpt from it. Uh, it's in the Journal of Discourse. It's great. He starts to explain what happened to him. He said, I became jealous of the prophet. That's really what's going on. It's not about milk stripping. Then I saw it double. I overlooked everything that was right. I spent all my time looking for the evil. And then when the devil began to lead me, it was easy for the carnal mind to rise up, which is anger, jealousy, and wrath. I could feel it within me. I felt angry and wrathful. I got mad, and I wanted everybody else to be mad. I talked with Brother Brigham and Brother Heber, and I wanted them to be mad like myself. And I saw that they were not mad, and I got madder still because they were not. Brother Brigham with a cautious look said, Are you the leader of the church, Brother Thomas? I answered, No. Well then, said he, Why do you not let that alone? He goes on to say, He says, Brothers and sisters, if, you, uh, if any of you are thinking about leaving the church, prepare your back for a good whipping. Uh, he said, that's, that's what the Lord has done to me. Because he's loved me, he's whipped me. He said, I have lost, not, uh, uh, I've lost everything, and the church has lost nothing from me leaving you. 
very pathetic testimony, after which it was voted that they should bring him back into fellowship 19 years later. So was he baptized again then? After yeah, that? Was, yeah. hmm. Joseph Smith, sitting, meanwhile back at Kirtland during this year, Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon and Thomas B. Marsh before all that, go to Canada to visit the saints and preach there. While they're gone, the enemies of the church, the apostates, attempted an armed takeover of the Kirtland Temple with like guns and bowie knives and stuff. John Boynton, one of the apostles, was, was in on that. They were holding a meeting and all of a sudden he busts out. Like, he's like, everyone? He's like, they're hijacking the temple. He's like, everyone? He's like, damn, right? And someone's like, hey, you have no right to it. He's like, I want to blow your beeping brains out. And then the accounts of this are like, uh, And Joseph Smith Sr. is up there on the stand. Like, oh, my heavens. Uh, and things are bad. Things are bad. Uh, we're going to call this whole season a season of apostasy. So when Joseph returns, they find that this, this is not going in a good direction. He and Sidney and uh, William Smith go and find gathering places in far west Missouri for the saints. Meanwhile, uh, Brigham Young is getting death threats on his life. Um, and by January, so he'll flee. And then Joseph and Sidney will flee for the same reason in, Kirtland, or, or in uh, January from Kirtland to far west. Holy smokes. Uh, Brigham says... On the morning of December 22nd, I left Kirtland in consequence of the apostates who had threatened to destroy me because I would proclaim publicly and privately that I knew by the power of the Holy Ghost that Joseph Smith was a prophet of the Most High God. What was the fallout during that time period? Uh, 10 to 15 percent of general membership, but 33 percent of general authorities left the church. 33 percent. That's a third. That's a third. I believe we've had a prophet among us. 33%. Uh, one woman said, a sister there, she, she reflected, we all felt more sorrowful at seeing the apostles leave the church than we did over our own trials and persecutions. That was the hardest thing. Can you imagine? Four of them in full rebellion. Some of them disillusioned against President Nelson. And just and the saints like watching this happen. Uh, you know, one of them yeah. shows into shows up to one of the temple dedications instead of dedicating, pulls out a gun. He's like, "All right, you know, we're taking this place over." He's like, "What the heck is happening?" Uh, right to the church at this time. By the way, by the way, this is awesome. So partly be proud. He doesn't stay disillusioned too long. He snaps out of it. When you know this cool story, John Taylor comes from Canada to Kirtland for the first time. Super excited to be with the saints. He comes into this, and he's like, what the hell? Uh, partly takes him aside, he's like, Brother John, things have changed, here's what's going on, I'm not sure if Joseph is, you know, where they are. And John's like, he says, it surprises me to hear you speak this way, Parley. I believe six months ago you told me that you knew that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that the work that he was promulgating was heaven's truth. You said you knew it by the Spirit of the Lord and that if you are an angel of God, you say other to me that I should not believe. I'm not following you, and I'm not following Joseph Smith. I'm following the Lord. You led me into this church, and I now follow him, and I have the same witness now that you had six months ago. Brother Parley, if the church and kingdom of God was on earth six months ago, if Joseph Smith was a true prophet of God six months ago, he's a prophet of God now. It was awesome. Nailed Parley to the wall. <laughs> and Parley's like, guy, I'm so sorry. Shortly after that, Parley goes to Joseph Smith, confesses everything, his doubts, unbelief. Uh, he had written a nasty letter insinuating Joseph and Sidney were wrong in their financial decisions. He totally confessed all that and said, I'm sorry. Joseph embraced him, forgave him. Harley never falters after that. So he, he falters for like a monthish during that. That's it. Harley. Thanks to his convert, I think that sobered him again and kind of slapped some sense back in. Now it's interesting today, uh, we have former church historian. Uh, Marlon K. Jensen, he said, speaking of the 15 men that are above being the hierarchy of the church, he said, they, are, they really care about what's happening in the church right now. And they realize that maybe since Kirtland, we've never had a period of, I'll call it apostasy, like we're having right now, largely over church history issues found on the internet. There are people back in that day that fell away, and Wilford Woodruff says, it happened. Why did they apostatize? Getting some answers to that question. 
Joseph said, Of the twelve apostles chosen in Kirtland, there have been but two, but what have lifted their heel against me, namely Brigham Young and Heber Zekin. The rest of those ten had some faltering moments, except those two, except these two. Why? What did they do? What was it about them that kept them safe? They were there at the same time. They experienced all the same church history issues. But they didn't fall, and ten others faltered, and some went way off, and some snapped out of it. But what, what was it about them? Wilbur Woodruff said, in Kirtland, a number of the Corps of the Twelve Apostles apostatized. Why did they apostatize? Because they forsook the Lord. They stopped praying. They wanted to get rich. They sought for the honors of men and for the riches of the world. And notwithstanding they were apostles, their power fell from them. If a man wishes to keep faithful, he's got to live near to the Lord. Remember his prayers and realize that he is at work for the Lord and his kingdom. Really? Prayers? Is prayer really going to do it? You imagine your neighbor comes to you and they're like, struggle with some church history issues and stuff. What happens if you say, you need to pray more sincerely? What happens? <laughs> That's not going to usually cut it, right? Could that really be the solution? You stop praying. you got to remember their prayers. If you want to stay faithful, I don't know. Let's look at uh, Hebrews and Kindle. One of those two that were solid. This order of things increased during the winter to such an extent that the man's life was in danger the moment he spoke in defense of the prophet of God. The only consolation I had was in bending my knees continually before my Father in heaven and asking him to sustain me and preserve me from falling into snares and from betraying my brethren as others had done. Brigham Young, the other one. During the siege of darkness, I stood close by Joseph, and with all the wisdom and power God bestowed upon me, I put forth my utmost energies to sustain the servant of God. I could not sleep those days. I spent many a night, all night, without sleeping at all. I prayed a good deal. Brother Maxwell told about a little girl named Melissa House, whose father was dying from cancer. He quoted her at conference. She said, he said, I love this prayer. She said, quote, Heavenly Father, please bless our daddy. We want him. We love him. But if you need him more than we do, you can have him. But please help us not to be mad at you either. Something about the power of prayer. Jesus looked at his apostles in 3 Nephi 18 and he says, Satan desires to have you. Pray always. Pray always. Pray always. Maybe there's more protection in the power of prayer. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. amen.